In this lecture, we'll discuss medical nutrition therapy for HIV and AIDS. So a little bit of a background. So remember that HIV is the human immunodeficiency virus. And so this is a virus that affects T helper cells and other hosts' immune cells and turns them into viral factories for HIV reproduction. Now again, remember the main symptom being that it affects the body's ability to fight off infection and disease, and HIV eventually progresses to AIDS. So HIV is transmitted via exchange of bodily fluids during sexual contact, sharing of contaminated needles, or by receiving infected blood via transfusion, or from an HIV-infected mother to the neonate. Now the most common route for men is male-to-male -male sexual contact, and the most common route for women is heterosexual contact. HIV can also be transmitted via breastfeeding, and so infected mothers are encouraged to use formula. However, right, we do have to weigh the pros and cons, right, and the risks and benefits in areas where water supply may not be safe. And then looking at AIDS, remember that's our acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So again, remember that AIDS is not a separate disease, right? It's caused by the same virus. It's just a progression with a syndrome, which is a collection of symptoms. And so this is caused by HIV with the first case reported in 1981. So this is a symptomatic condition making the individual vulnerable to opportunistic infections that can cause disability or death. Now that being said, death is no longer seen as the inevitable outcome due to effective medical and nutrition interventions. And so the proper nutrition status can help slow the progression of HIV to AIDS alongside, of course, right, we'll talk about the medical therapies, which involves antiretrovirals, et cetera. So looking at the epidemiology, so 33.4 million people worldwide living with HIV or AIDS as of 2008, with 2.7 million new infections in 2008, and 2 million HIV-related deaths in 2008. And the most prevalent is in African countries, and this accounts for two-thirds of the current total infections, and 1.2 million in the U.S. in 2008 living with HIV AIDS, and 21% may be unaware of their HIV status. And approximately 200 children in the U.S. are born each year with HIV. Now, there's been over 25 million deaths since AIDS has been identified, with the majority of new infections in minority and youth with poor access to health care. And so the rate of new infections in men is trending up since 2005, but is stable in women. And in sub-Saharan Africa, most new infections are via heterosexual transmission. Now the progression of HIV to death has been delayed due to antiretroviral therapy, which we will discuss later in this lecture. So again, here we can see, so this was the 2008 global prevalence of HIV AIDS. So we can see with uh, just over two-thirds of cases in sub-Saharan Africa, and then we can see the distribution with Eastern Europe and Central Asia, Middle East and North Africa and Oceania, North America, Western and Central Europe, East, South, and Southeast Asia, and the Caribbean and Latin America. And so here we can see the different patterns of how HIV is acquired in males and females. With females, a large portion being heterosexual contact with some injection drug use, and then the very, very small category of other. And then with males, we see a much larger variety of different modes of transmission. So we have male-to-male -male sexual contact with drug use, male-to-male -male sexual contact, other, heterosexual contact, and injection drug use. Remember, HIV is a retrovirus, so a single-stranded RNA virus, and so this targets the CD4 immune cell, or T helper cells, replicating to produce copies of the virus inside of the host cell. And so this targets GI cells, organ cells, nervous system cells, and immune cells. And so this leads to the progressive destruction and depletion of CD4 cells, which leads to immunodeficiency. Now, this can cause related opportunistic infections and complications with nutrition implications. Now, the textbook has four clinical phases of HIV, so we'll talk about this a little bit later and we'll take a look at the CDC's categories, but just be aware of these for the book. So phase one, we have acute HIV infection. Phase two, clinical latency or asymptomatic HIV infection. Phase three, we have symptomatic HIV infection and stage four is progression of HIV to AIDS. Now the two main biomarkers to assess disease progression are CD4 count, 
which is the number of CD4 T helper cells, and viral load, which is the amount of virus measured in the blood. Now looking at how HIV is acquired, so we have to have both exposure and a dose requirement, and this is with all viruses and bacteria. And so it's possible to be exposed without seroconversion, which is the change in a person's antibody status from negative to positive. And so acute HIV infection is the time from transmission of HIV to the host until seroconversion occurs. And this usually occurs within three weeks to three months after exposure. And so if HIV testing is done before seroconversion occurs, then a false negative may result. Now, early signs and symptoms include sore throat, swollen lymph nodes, skin rashes, muscle and joint pain, diarrhea, fever, and malaise. And symptomatic HIV involves chronic diarrhea, persistent fevers, unexplained weight loss, and recurrent fungal or bacterial infections. And the progression of HIV to AIDS, so without treatment, AIDS develops in 26 to 36% of HIV infected persons within seven years. And current drug therapies, though, have dramatically slowed this progression. And so the CDC classifies AIDS as a CD4 count of less than 200 or documentation of an AIDS-defining condition. And so you, here you have the list of AIDS-defining clinical conditions. And so you'll see these are opportunistic infections that patients wouldn't normally have if they had not had a weakened immune system. So again, so depletion of T helper cells eventually increases susceptibility to these opportunistic infections. And so these are infections that are caused again by microorganisms that would not normally cause disease, but are damaging to those with compromised immune function. So you'll also see this, for example, in patients that have had radiation therapy in preparation for bone marrow transplant, they're also at risk for opportunistic infections, right? Because it's anybody with a weakened immune system. Looking at GI tract complications, we also have AIDS enteropathy. So more than 60% of the body's T lymphocytes reside in the GI tract. So this is characterized by villous atrophy and blunting, intestinal cell losses and inflammation. And this results in a substantial reduction in intestinal absorptive area. And this can cause salivary gland disease, oral lesions, taste changes, malabsorption, chronic diarrhea, and weight loss. Now looking at the clinical manifestations, so we have AIDS-related wasting syndrome with a weight loss of 10% without a known cause accompanied by fever or diarrhea for more than a month, and Kaposi's sarcoma, which is a type of cancer causing abnormal tissue growth under the skin, characterized by lesions in the skin, lungs, and GI tract. And so here you can see the Kaposi's sarcoma. And so here we have a selected list of clinical manifestations of HIV infection and their treatment. Now, again, the list is much longer than this. This is an abbreviated list, though, but going through the major organ systems with cardiac, neurological, GI, hematological, liver, immune system, etc. Now, again, we said the book has four phases, whereas the CDC only has three stages, so... I want you to be aware of both, but again, what I was trained with was the three stages, so I would be aware of this one. So stage one is, again, we said acute HIV infection, so it can occur within two to four weeks after a person is infected with HIV. In some people, this stage of HIV can take up to three months to develop, and during acute HIV infection, many people have flu-like symptoms such as fever, headache, and rash. And in the acute stage of infection, HIV multiplies rapidly and spreads throughout the body. The virus attacks and destroys the infection-fighting CD4 cells of the immune system, and HIV can be transmitted during any stage of infection, but the risk is greatest during the acute HIV infection. Stage 2 is chronic HIV infection, and so the second stage of HIV infection is chronic HIV, also called asymptomatic HIV infection or clinical latency, and during the stage of the disease, HIV continues to multiply in the body, but at very low levels. And people with chronic HIV infection may not have any HIV-related symptoms, but they can still spread HIV to others. And so chronic HIV infection can last up to 10 years or longer. And stage three is progression to AIDS, which is the final stage of HIV infection. And so because HIV has destroyed the immune system, the body can't fight off opportunistic infections 
and cancers. And AIDS is diagnosed when a person with HIV has a CD4 less than 200 and or one or more opportunistic infections. So looking at the treatment of HIV, so we have antiretroviral drugs to reduce viral burden and destruction of the immune cells. And then we have prevention and treatment of opportunistic infections, modulation of altered hormonal balance, and maintenance and restoration of nutrition status, where we come in. So looking at antiretroviral therapy, so these are medications that are used to lower the viral load. And there's six classes, and it's more of just being aware of. I don't expect you to be an expert in, in all of these drugs. Um, but we have nucleotide or nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, entry or fusion inhibitors, chemokine receptor 5 antagonist, and integrase inhibitors. So here we have a table of when to begin antiretroviral therapy. So it's recommended that treatment be initiated for those with asymptomatic AIDS or asymptomatic HIV infections. Although some clinicians may recommend that antiretroviral therapy doesn't need to be initiated until CD4 count drops below 500. And I, while I've seen this written several times, every clinician I've ever spoken to in person has always recommended beginning antiretroviral therapy as soon as someone's aware of their status. Um, so I am still trying to find information as to why there's this difference in this recommendations for when to begin antiretroviral therapy. Now looking at other treatment options, so as a subcategory of antiretroviral therapy, we have heart therapy or highly active antiretroviral therapy. And so this is using three or more medications. Now this is very, very effective. Um, the problem is, is that it does cost more. The, the virus can build up drug resistance. It results in more complicated drug schedules with meal and food requirements and timing requirements and making sure that we're aware of any drug nutrient interactions pill burden from having to take more medications, increased side effects, and physical or biochemical abnormalities. Now, successful antiretroviral therapy, though, requires nearly perfect adherence, so 95% or better. Um, it's actually gotten better now that we have cell phones because you can basically set all of your different timers. So again, these medications have very, very narrow windows of when they need to be taken and in what order. Um, and then there's a lot of factors that increase poor adherence or poor compliance, including low levels of literacy, age-related challenges like vision loss and cognitive impairment, psychosocial issues, things like depression, homelessness, low social support, stressful life events, dementia and psychosis, active substance abuse, so heavy alcohol use is going to lessen the effectiveness of antiretroviral therapy, the stigma, of course, of HIV treatments, difficulty in taking medications, so we talk about that pill burden or the daily scheduling issues, treatment fatigue, um, again, just like diabetes, there's no days off, and adverse drug effects. Common side effects associated with antiretroviral therapy include loss of appetite, nausea and vomiting and diarrhea, abdominal pain, hepatotoxicity, gas, fat maldistribution, mouth and esophageal ulcers, hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia and insulin resistance, and taste alterations. Now, one of our major focus with nutrition, and again, treating what we can within our domain is prevention and treatment of wasting. And so we can do this with things like appetite stimulants. So you'll see like magestral acetate or dronabinol, um, or now that's been legalized in many states, so cannabis. Anti-catabolic and anabolic medications such as oxandrolone, so again this would be known as so Anavar to improve muscle function and body cell mass, this is a anabolic steroid. Hormone replacement therapies including testosterone may help maintain lean body mass or growth hormone, which again has shown improvement in body cell mass and a decrease in lipodystrophy. Looking at nutrition complications, so protein turnover rates are elevated due to a constant inflammatory state. We'll see changes in body composition with fat maldistribution and a loss of lean body mass. We'll see malabsorption leading to malnutrition. Oral lesions can cause poor PO intake, anemia, drug nutrient interactions, and weight loss. Looking at body composition changes, so we'll see changes in body shape. So we can, again, monitor this with anthropometric measurements using circumferences and skin folds. And so if we do see so dorso cervical fat pad behind the neck, again, this, if this is present, then this may indicate the patient has HIV-associated lipodystrophy syndrome. 
and changes should be monitored because again this can help us indicate or be aware of the progression of HIV. Now again looking at that fat distribution so metabolic abnormalities and body shape changes seen in patients with HIV so we'll see a fat deposit behind the neck known as a buffalo hump and breast hypertrophy with a loss of subcutaneous fat in the extremities face and buttocks and so again the specific reason for the development of lipodystrophy is unclear and the manifestations can vary greatly from patient to patient but it's also associated with elevated triglycerides LDL and low HDL and omega-3s may help if the patient has hypertriglyceridemia. And so here we can see again the buffalo hump or the dorsocervical, so again the back of the neck, so the fat distribution as well as the visceral fat. Again, you'll see then a decrease in subcutaneous fat and an increase in fat tissue in the breasts. And so here we can see again the wasting or the loss of subcutaneous fat in the extremities. So looking at the medical nutrition therapy, so the Academy's recommendations for medical nutrition therapy. So a baseline nutrition assessment after the diagnosis of HIV is made with one to two MNT sessions with the RD per year for individuals with asymptomatic HIV and two to six sessions with the RD per year for, for symptomatic but stable patients. And all HIV AIDS patients should have access to a dietitian. Now, patients may need to be seen more often if they're diagnosed with AIDS and they're requiring nutrition support, supplementation, etc. So again, things to monitor and be aware of in these patients, of course, is your standards, your height, weight, BMI, any history of weight changes, and again, good quality information on body composition. So looking at that, dis that lipodystrophy, skin folds, uh, mid-arm circumference, arm muscle area, again, looking at that maintenance of muscle mass. From a lab standpoint, we're looking at CD4 count and viral load, CRP, albumin and prealbumin. We talked about that constant state of inflammation, CBC, LFTs, again, with the medication's effects on the liver, renal function tests, blood glucose, lipid profile, iron status, and vitamin levels. And so here you can see, again, that type of information converted into uh, an easy-to-use chart for assessment of patients with HIV. So again, things we can focus on with our nutrition interventions. So we can be looking at macronutrients, do we need to increase protein, micronutrients, do we need to adjust right based on lab levels. We know that exercise recommendations, right, to improve muscle volume and function, prevention of weight loss, education and counseling, symptom management, looking at food and nutrient interactions, food safety, and of course, if necessary, nutrition support. So our major goals for MNT, so optimizing nutrition status, immunity, and well-being, maintaining a healthy weight and lean body mass, preventing nutrient deficiencies, reducing the risk of comorbidities, maximizing the effectiveness of medical and pharmacological treatments. So looking at our estimated needs for macronutrients, so with calories, we typically recommend 10% above normal if the patient is asymptomatic and 20 to 50% above normal if the patient has an opportunistic infection. For protein, again, 0.8 grams per kilogram should normally be okay, and then 10% above normal if opportunistic infection due to increased protein turnover. For fluids, we still recommend one milliliter per kcal or 30 to 35 milliliters per kilogram, although monitoring for any increased needs, if they're having any comorbidities, if there's any reason for additional fluid loss. And again, looking at fat, still following heart healthy guidelines, as again, part of that is a side effect of the medications. And remember, these patients can also have comorbidities. Looking at micronutrients, so low levels of vitamins A, B12, and zinc are associated with faster disease progression, and higher intakes of vitamins B and C are associated with increased CD4 counts and slower disease progression. And so there's no evidence to support that micronutrient supplements above the DRI for HIV patients is beneficial. Um, and again, remember that some of these, because they compete with each other, can have negative effects. Looking at complementary and alternative medicine. So again, this is very prevalent in patients with HIV. So 60% of those with HIV use some form of complementary and alternative medicine. But only one third of those using complementary and alternative medicine actually discloses to their healthcare providers. And so it's important to question patients carefully about their use of complementary and alternative medicine 
as some of these treatments can interfere with antiretroviral therapy. So, for example, garlic and St. John's wort will actually decrease blood levels of the medication, reducing its effectiveness. Looking at exercise, so exercise is recommended to help improve lean body mass and muscle function. It can help with decreasing fat accumulation and controlling blood lipid levels. And so the general recommendation is a routine including both aerobic and resistance exercise at least three times per week. Again, extremely cost-effective therapy uh, or intervention. And so again, you're getting a lot of return on investment and significant health benefits. Again, when you're looking at immune function, cell mass, lean body mass, etc. So here again, we see we want to recommend both resistance training as well as aerobic training as it has effects, right? So we're looking at both the cardiovascular and the musculoskeletal effects, right? And its interaction with HIV. Looking at HIV in women, so women accounted for 25% of the new cases of HIV in the U.S. in 2008. And HIV infected women of childbearing age should receive counseling prior to conception. So antiretroviral therapy is initiated during pregnancy to the mother, and it's initiated to the child after birth. And so mother-to-child transmission is less than 2% in the U.S. with antiretroviral therapy interventions. So again, if we do everything right and with a careful delivery, right, so mom can deliver because they have independent blood supplies, mom can deliver a baby that is not infected with HIV. And so breastfeeding is not recommended if the mother is infected with HIV, even if taking antiretroviral therapies. And especially that's for U.S. recommendations because we have the option of formula and it's more readily available with programs like WIC. If, though, for example, you're in an area of the world where they do not have access to clean water, right, then it becomes a, a risk analysis of the risk of dying from dysentery with dirty water in formula or the risk of maybe catching HIV from mom. So it becomes then a, a very a dilemma, right? And so this is why you'll see a very, very strong emphasis on access to clean water um, to help kind of reduce these kinds of risks. Now, there's other interventions, of course, with clean water, um, but this is one of the major ones. Looking at HIV in children, so approximately 200 HIV-infected children are born each year in the U.S., and so transmission is in utero, during delivery, through breast milk, or via pre-mastication. And so weight and height in HIV-infected children generally lags behind uninfected children of the same age. And a loss of lean body mass and that halls, right, that fat maldistribution is seen in children. And so we know that a multivitamin may be beneficial, um, again, just ensuring for adequate growth as well as the increased needs from the HIV and treatments. So let's take a look at some practice questions. So medical nutrition therapy should begin for patients with HIV disease. And this is answer choice A, at the time of diagnosis. Number two, for antiretroviral therapy to be effective, adherence to medication schedules must be at least and this is answer choice D, 95%. Number three, AIDS enteropathy may cause And this is answer choice B, chronic diarrhea. Number four, in patients with HIV disease, loss of body weight is usually associated with increases in. And this is answer choice A, viral load. And number five, protein intake should only be restricted in patients with HIV disease if they have. And this is answer choice B, severe hepatic or renal disease, right? That, those comorbidities. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions.